Um, and, and to that end, um, I want to introduce you to my good friend, uh, Richard Podolsky, who is uh, our speaker this evening. Um, Richard and I have known each other since uh, the late 70s, where we both attended the University of Michigan. I was finishing a bachelor's degree and Richard was working on his doctorate. And uh, we became good friends and, and Richard was studying seabirds. And uh, uh, he invited me to join him uh, for some of his uh, doctoral work on the island of Kauai in the Hawaiian chain, where we worked on Laysan albatross colonization and, and some of the mechanics involved with that. Um, after Richard got his PhD, um, he invited me to join him in the Galapagos, where we worked with the Hawaiian petrel on a similar sort of project. Um, so I've kind of tagged along with Richard uh, over the years on some of his uh, research and, uh, and have been uh, the beneficiary of going to some really beautiful places. Um, Richard has worked uh, 11 years on National Audubon's uh, uh, Atlantic Puffin Project. He was one of the very first uh, people participating in the restoration of the puffins to uh, uh, Eastern Egg Rock. And uh, he's worked, as I mentioned, uh, at the Charles Darwin Station in the Galapagos with that project. Um, and he's done other works uh, around the, the world on various uh, bird, bird projects. He's had his own uh, consulting business for the past uh, 30, 40 years um, in avian um, issues. And uh, it's with that uh, that Richard is coming to us live from Camden, Maine. Uh, right there on the uh, on the Gulf of uh, uh, the Penobscot Bay. So with that, Richard, I turn it over to you and thank you so much for being with us this evening. My, my pleasure. Can, uh, can you all hear me okay? I have earbuds in, so I just wanna make sure that you can, can hear, hear me you. fine. Yeah, thank good. you, Richard. <clears throat> I'll share my screen in a minute, but I just wanna say thank you to Dave for inviting me to give this talk. You know, I think it's great, I mean, uh, you know, Nevada is a long way from, certainly from the Gulf of Maine, which will be the region I'll focus on. Uh, but uh, I think it must be, if I was sitting where you are, I'd like to hear about ocean birds and seabirds. And I'll try to keep it positive because um, that's the way, I, the way I roll. But let me share my screen and I'll start the talk right now. Um, um, yeah, we're trying to sustain seabirds and that'll be the focus of my talk. Um, and when we get into some of the numbers here pretty quickly about what the status of ocean birds are um, around the world, you'll see that it's, there's some real challenges going on right now. And ocean, oceanic birds are kind of at the, the bleeding edge of a lot of the conservation issues that we hear a lot about. They, uh, they're experiencing climate change more than a lot of other groups of birds. Um, sea level rise is impacting them. Um, and so they're really a great species that's a good on-ramp to some of the important conservation issues. And I'll tell you what we're doing, uh, trying to do to um, stabilize them and sustain seabirds. Um, I'll talk kind of broadly first about some of the global challenges. And then I'm gonna talk about some of the local actions right here in the Gulf of Maine. We have, of course, seabirds up and down the East Coast and along the West Coast and um, uh, around the world. But I'm gonna focus on our, our Gulf of Maine because it's a, a really good test bed for some of the issues that are if, um, impacting uh, oceanic birds. Um, under global challenges, I'm gonna cover what and where and how many seabirds there are what kind of role do they play um, in terms of ecosystem services? What are their major threats? And what are the conservation actions that, are, uh, that we're taking? And then locally, I'm gonna talk about what's happening with sea surface temperature and seabirds. I'm gonna talk about some of the local threats and some of the conservation actions that, to address those. And then I'll talk about monitoring because it's so important. I heard in the introduction, um, the introduction talks, you're, you know, you're working on jays, you're working on uh, sage grouse. And um, so these will be themes that'll be familiar to you, the, the role and the importance of getting out there and bird watching and reporting your results. And then I'll do a little summary 
of the uh, global and local issues. So um, in a very, very basic sense, you, you become a seabird when you, um, when you feed and breed in marine ecosystems. We have lots of birds uh, that spend half the year on the ocean, you know, during their winter months, we have loons that are very common on the ocean, but they breed up on lakes. And, uh, and so they don't really kind of make the cut. So we have a pretty strict definition. You have to get all or most of your food and you have to breed in the marine in a marine ecosystem, and then you get to be part of a rather small group, as you'll see in a minute. In fact, there's only five orders of um, seabirds, the charadriforms, including gulls, terns, puffins, and alcids. And some of those are fresh water, by the way. Not all the gulls are, are ocean or marine birds. Uh, same is true with the pelicaniforms. Uh, I see your logo for your group is, I guess it's a white pelican. That's a you know, it's not, yeah, it can be seen on salt water, but they're not typically found there. Um, there's a few freshwater cormorants. Uh, all the tropic birds are true marine birds, though. The prosolariforms is really the big group of ocean going birds. Uh, far as I can think, there's none that are freshwater. All the petrels, shearwaters, albatross. And this is the group that I have really focused on. Uh, Dave mentioned our work with albatross in Hawaii, our work with petrels in uh, Galapagos, and um, uh, I've studied all the major groups of prosolariforms. It's really the group that I'm most interested in. I've been a penguin tourist on the Antarctic, but I've never really done any science or studies of the penguins, but all the penguins are uh, true seabirds. And then a few ducks fall into a category of being truly marine birds. Um, uh, and we let a few, we let a few of the uh, ducks into the, uh, into the group. And then I have a few pictures showing gulls and uh, that's a Wilson storm petrel. That's a double crested cormorant. Um, and I think that's a, either a king or, or emperor penguin chick. So let's talk about some of the numbers now. You may know that total worldwide right now, we have about 9,000 species of birds total. Now here's something I think is rather interesting. I, uh, I've been aware of this fact for a very long time, but I still have a hard time getting my head completely around it. There's only 330 uh, thereabouts species of true seabirds, and that's only 3%. And uh, what shocks me about that is um, we are a water planet. Almost three quarters of the planet is um, ocean, our oceans and salt water, but yet only uh, about these three, little over 300 species have figured out a way to uh, become fully uh, dependent on the marine environment. And I think the, the, the lesson there is um, it's, it's a harsh environment and, and, and it's not an easy place to survive. Um, so although there's a lot of ocean on, the, on earth, uh, very few birds, only 3%. And I just threw a few statistics in about mammals. It's about half the, half the number of mammals as there are birds. But again, we only have about 130 species, or again, this 3% of mammals have been able to figure out how to make a living down on the ocean. Uh, these next two numbers are kind of important and a little bit chilling, endangered. Uh, 92 species of seabirds are endangered. That's almost one out of every three seabirds. And, um, almost a similar number for marine mammals. So um, seabirds, marine mammals are, uh, they're in rough shape. They're, they're, um, many of them are on the brink of extinction. And it's uh, unfortunate, but there's a lot we can do. And I'll talk about what some of those things are. This is a, a little bit of an interesting fact. When you look at all 300 
species of seabirds. There's about five, five species of seabird that are only known from being seen at sea. They're, they, they, um, there are no known nesting islands for about five species of seabird. They're all, again, they're only known from having been seen uh, at sea and we don't know where they, uh, we, where they nest. The other thing is out of the 330 bird uh, seabirds, 36 species are only found be on, on one to three islands. Um, and I think that about half of that 36, 18, about 18 or 20 species of seabird are only known for nesting on a single island. So they're a single island endemic. Um, 39 species are found in under between four and 10 islands in the whole world. And then the re remaining numbers are from 11 and greater. So these are seabirds, some of the species, many of the seabirds are very, very rare indeed and only have a very few. Uh, and in some cases, uh, only a single um, nesting location. Of course, that makes them vulnerable. You've all heard the expression, all your eggs in one basket. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, seabirds that have gone extinct. The most dramatic or notable one is a flightless species of auk that was in the um, in the North Atlantic called the Great Auk. Um, and there's a few other seabirds that have already gone extinct. Um, and then extirpations, which are local extinctions, there's numerous examples of, of stocks of seabirds that, um, that have gone extinct in, in particular locations. And um, oh, there's probably a, a half a dozen or more that of seabirds that where there's fewer than 100 individuals remaining right now. We have some really critically rare uh, species of seabird, but the great auk is a, 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 a dramatic example of um, you know human caused extinction. It was basically hunted to extinction. Um, seabirds do some important work out in the ecosystem. They are, are very important in terms of nutrient cycling and recycling in the ocean environment. Um, you know, they're apex predators. So um, uh, they act as predators and um, they move nutrients around the marine environment. Um, they help stabilize uh, uh, food webs by being top predators. Um, from an economic standpoint, they're an important food source in some places and a fertilizer source. This very dramatic picture down in Chile, um, there are uh, islands where the birds have been nesting for probably millions of years. And there's literally hundreds of feet thick of their kind of fossilized guano that is bagged up, as you can see, and used for fertilizer. Um, instead of making it into the marine environment, uh, this goes onshore. Um, and seabirds are very important environmental indicators. They're, they're sentinels and they tell us about how the ocean is doing. Um, these are the main global threats to uh, seabirds right now. And the reason we have almost a third of the seabirds are are threatened with, uh, are, are at, on the verge of extinction is because this list has six things on it. In other words, you don't get a, a critically endangered species unless there's multiple um, threats uh, impacting them. Uh, invasive species, these are somewhat in order of the importance, um, but not entirely, because it varies from seabird to seabird. But rats, cats, goats, and pigs, and the list could go on. But uh, those are the big ones for invasive species that are impacting them. Habitat loss, coastal development, and some of these pictures down here kind of feature some of these, um, show, show a little bit of 
of each one of those. Uh, climate change, in the last 20 years, uh, we have sea level rise. Many seabirds nest very close to the water's edge. So uh, as the uh, sea level rise and storms intensify, they can be impacted. Um, with, uh, with warming, there's acidification of uh, surface waters that has an impact on food web. Um, hunting is still an issue in some places. Uh, seabirds are still uh, on the menu and um, there is still legal hunting um, for some seabirds and that has an impact. Fisheries conflicts probably should be higher on the list, especially bycatch. Um, and then also when we're successful at in, in, in catching fish, uh, we deplete stocks and make it harder for for birds to find food because um, we're harvesting it before they can. And then there's a lot of issues with plastic and toxins, oil, uh, plastics, and then um, just water quality eutrophication in particular. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the things that, you know, when you go into like, all right, so, roll up your sleeves, what, what do we, what, do, what can we do? Um, you know, we try to reduce invasive species. In New Zealand, they work very successfully at uh, getting rats and cats off of um, uh, seabird nesting islands. And that has a huge management implication. So we try to reduce invasive species, reduce pollution and keep the water clean as possible. Uh, keep the trophic structure stable and make sure there's food for everybody, including seabirds. Um, restoring, enhancing, and creating new habitat. This was kind of the, at the core of what Dave and I were working on, both in Hawaii and in Galapagos. And in fact, it's been kind of a thread and theme throughout my career, and that is restoration um, of seabird habitat and rebuilding of, of uh, populations. Um, and that's number five. We, we try to augment colonies, create new colonies, restore them and stabilize them. And then of course, monitoring everywhere along the line. Um, I'll talk a little bit about puffins. I worked with, uh, with them for quite a few years. The albatross project with our decoys uh, is in this slide. Our work with um, Dave said Hawaiian petrel. It's actually called the Galapagos petrel now, uh, but it was at the time Dave and I were working on it, it was lumped together with the Hawaiian petrel. And then Dave and I also worked on this little uh, Newell shearwater. The last uh, picture on the right there is uh, um, a, a local Hawaiian woman releasing a Newell shearwater uh, back to the wild on a restoration project. And that, I don't know if you remember Dave, but that was a little side project that we uh, got asked to help out on. Um, so let's just jump and talk about the Gulf of Maine, right where I live. As they mentioned, I'm in Camden, right on the shores of the Gulf of Maine. And since 1980, we have had a steady rise in uh, water temperature, um, and uh, and it's significant and it's real. Um, we have uh, considerably warming waters. This point right here, this was our 2012. We broke every record uh, for high temperatures um, in the Gulf of Maine, and not just at the surface, but at all depths of water. Um, so the entire volume of the Gulf of Maine uh, hit record heights. Uh, we did come back to a little bit lower, but, but basically the trend in, is, uh, you know, increasing water temperature. And that's having a lot of ecological implications. And I'm gonna talk about some of those right now. Um, all these, this is the coast of Maine, right here is the uh, border with New Hampshire down here. And we go all the way up to the Canadian border. 
um, with New Brunswick. From, from New Brunswick back to New Hampshire, that's if you snap a line, that's 200 miles. And we've got about 400 seabird islands. The, the big principal ones are, um, are the red ones. These are the biggest seabird islands and they're kind of evenly spaced along the coast of Maine. And then we've got a lot of secondary or tertiary uh, seabird islands, just fewer numbers, fewer species, um, but still important uh, seabird islands, um, again, all up and down um, the coast. The ones in red, we've been monitoring them, oh my gosh, for almost 40 years. We uh, uh, gather all of the breeding bird data for all of those islands and we gather every August and we uh, collect all this data. So we have really good trends data and um, it really helps from management standpoint. But those are our seabird islands. Um, and let's talk about uh, the actual birds that we've got here in the Gulf of Maine. Of the 330 total seabirds worldwide, 16 of them are found here in the Gulf of Maine. Um, I, I've colored in red the three that I want to talk a little bit about. Arctic terns is like this fantastic, uh, you know, two hemisphere migrant. Um, and that's this bird right back here. Um, they go from really from the high Arctic, they go all the way in the, um, in the, um, in the winter, they migrate to the Antarctic. Um, and we tell this uh, Arctic tern, it's got an all red bill and very, very short legs because it's the most pelagic. Uh, this next turn over is a common turn. It has a black tip to the beak, longer legs. And then this is the very rare and endangered roseate turn of which we've got a couple of, maybe a couple of hundred in the Northeast, very rare bird, but we have them here in Maine. Um, I'll play a little vocalization of the uh, Arctic Tern so you can hear it. And they do that all day long over the colonies. They constantly, const very, no, not a very diverse vocal repertoire, but very repetitious and they call all day long. Another very, very interesting member of the Alcid family, this is a bird, uh, the razor bill is probably the closest relative of the great auk. Um, and they're um, a threatened species in the state of Maine. Um, we only have a few hundred of them, um, but uh, uh, it's an important seabird and one that we're managing carefully for and of course monitoring very carefully. Um, then we have our year round alcid, um, uh, this black guillemot. Um, they're uh, here in, in the, the Gulf of Maine year round. And uh, in uh, the winter, they turn almost all white. So it's kind of like a Arctic fox or ptarmigan, uh, a few, mostly mammals actually. Can't think of too many birds. A ptarmigan is one that has like almost a completely white plumage in the winter. But anyway, that's the black guillemot. And it it almost feeds entirely ex and exclusively on this red rock eel. It's a little gunnel fish that's found uh, really under rocks in the ocean. And uh, this guillemot dives down, they, they fly underwater with their wings outspread and they turn rocks over, there's videos of them flipping rocks over looking for this uh, red rock eel. Um, the razorbill has a yellow lining to the mouth. The guillemot is a vermilion lining to the mouth, just like the feet just peeking out here. Uh, in addition to those three, I'll, I have another slide. I'll talk about Atlantic puffins. 
leeches, petrol, great cormorants, commoniters. Manx shearwater is a new arrival um, to the Gulf of Maine. Uh, laughing gulls are increasing. I mentioned the roseate terns. We have a few least terns, common terns, herring, blackback gulls, and then of course, double crested cormorants. Hey Richard, before you move on from this slide, um, we weren't able to hear the um, sound. Can you try that again and see if we can sure. get that to work? All right, here's an Arctic turn. Mm -hmm. Any luck? I'm not hearing it. I know we tested this before and it was working, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Sound is always like a problem in, yeah. in PowerPoint. <laughs> I don't know why, but um, I went out of my way to really, you know, really bomb proof that. But um, I know I can't. I can't. Um, I can't okay. explain it. I figured we'd try it can. again. <laughs> well, we got two other chances here right. because this is our Atlantic puffin. Um, Atlantic puffins were almost extirpated from Maine. There was only one island uh, out of the six that historically had puffins. They got uh, wiped off, extirpated from five of the six islands. And on the one island where they survived, there was only one pair. <laughs> so this bird, you know, literally um, was hanging by a thread in the Gulf of Maine. And this is why we chose to restore the Atlantic puffin. It's a, just a fantastic bird. And I'll talk about the project. We basically hand raised, we went to Newfoundland and brought 2000 puffins down over a 10 year period and hand raised them and they reestablished. Uh, I'm gonna try again. I'm gonna play the call of the puffin. Maybe you'll hear this, okay? Let's give it a shot. Are you hearing that? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> well, then I won't try with the stairs. Well, I heard something just then. Um, so uh, this is the uh, leech of storm petrel. Uh, it nests on 16 islands on the out of the roughly 4,000 available islands on the coast of Maine. It's found on about 16 islands. Um, it has a fork tail, um, nocturnal bird. You don't see it during the day at all, um, unless you're way offshore. I'll show their distribution map. And then finally, this is a, a bird that is really, really rare. This is our rarest seabird, it's the great cormorant. There's under 50 of them in the whole state of Maine. Um, it's a northern cormorant. It kind of replaces the double crested cormorant as you move to towards Labrador, Newfoundland, and up into the North Atlantic. The great cormorant replaces the double crested, but it's almost twice the size. Um, it's quite a different bird. It has a white gular lining to their throat pouch. Um, it has some white feathers by the by the legs. So and again it's a quite a bit bigger, quite a quite a bit larger. Um, so those are our Gulf of Maine seabirds and many of them are on the edge, but again we monitor them all very, very closely. And um, Uh, uh, it's playing the um, 
the uh, did you just lose the screen? Yeah, it's on your desktop right now. Okay, yeah. There we go. I want to talk about some of the distribution of these birds. Um, this is again the East Coast. Uh, these are the, the interesting thing about the storm petrel distribution is uh, we have them inshore, but then there's a big group of them that are seen past the continental shelf. This blue line that you see here is where the water drops off from you know, a few hundred feet to several thousand feet deep of water. And the storm petrels, by day, they're on their nesting islands here in the um, interior of the, of the uh, Gulf of Maine. But at night, they go out to the edge of the continental shelf and that's where they get their food from. The same is true with the shearwaters, the bank shearwaters, sooty, greater, quarries. These are, uh, some of these are just uh, only found during the summer months. They're Southern hemisphere seabirds that come into the Gulf of Maine as, as migrants. And again, they're, they have a split distribution. This was a real eye opener for us. And um, uh, this is all from at sea surveys that are done. Um, the gulls, however, stay all close to shore and close to the islands. They don't exploit the outer continental shelf. Same is true with the northern gannets that we have. They uh, like the shallower water. They're a plunge diver on, on fish and they're found inshore. So we don't have this kind of split distribution. Fulmars, we get a few that have seen off on the continental shelf. Those are probably transit, transit birds. Most of our northern fulmar sightings are found up in the interior of the Gulf of Maine. And again, most of our alcids are um, inside the Gulf of Maine. Um, dove keys, we have a few sightings of dove keys off the continental shelf. Um, again, those are in Dove keys don't nest in the Gulf of Maine, but they use, use our water seasonally. I want to talk about our for almost 50 years that we've been monitoring and managing Atlantic puffins. We went through a phase in the 1970s and 80s where we were hand raising puffins. We would give them cut pieces of fish in a burrow. This is a bird that was collected in Newfoundland from, uh, from a colony off the coast of Newfoundland that we think had a half a million puffins. So we did take 2,000 of them. Um, uh, on Eastern Egg Rock, we transplanted and raised a thousand of them. And then we used decoys and some vegetation and predator control. And um, in 1981, we had our first breeding puffins from the ones that we hand raised. Uh, we had four in 81, and then the numbers just kind of went up from there. This slide only goes to 2017. Last summer, there were 220 breeding puffins on Eastern Egg Rock. We also did a similar transplant of a thousand to another island called Seal Island. Um, I don't have a slide for that one, but that was even more successful. Those thousand puffins that we raised on Seal Island, there's now about 600 uh, nesting pair of puffins on Seal Island. So we've had uh, very, very good success with that species. Um, this is the little leeches storm petrel of which there's only about 16 islands where they nest. We chose three other islands, Old, Old Hump Ledge, Ross Island, and Franklin Island. 
And um, we did several years of artificial burrows and sound, and we got colonization on some colonization uh, on each one. The most successful was Old Hump Ledge. We were actually able to establish them as a breeding bird there. Um, uh, similar story on Ross Island, but only a one year effort. And then we had visitation, but no breeding on Franklin Island. So, you know, it's a mixed story. Some cases, very good success. But you can see the leeches petrels about the size of a American robin. In the last few years, with the help of Fish and Wildlife Service here in Maine, uh, we've got some very handy, small, and very portable uh, uh, transmitters that have uh, been put on a few puffins and some razor bills. That'll be the next slide. And um, those were put on on an outer island here called Matinicus Rock. And all of those red dots are one individual, the, the uh, location of one individual, uh, the green and yellow are uh, two others. I think there was a total of five that were outfitted with the transmitters. And we got some rather good information. We now could see, you know, where these birds are going and what kind of region of the ocean they're using. This is helpful. They're talking about um, Maine wants to install offshore wind turbines out here in the, uh, beyond the outer islands. And um, this kind of information tells us a little bit uh, to help uh, guide that process. Um, this is another effort uh, where we had a, even a more powerful transmitter on puns in orange and razor bills in purple. And again, we got to see the wanderings and habitat use. Puffins are more offshore and razor bills are more inshore. Uh, the razorbills also tend, tended to go up into the Bay of Fundy region, and the puffins tend to go off into the Grand Banks more. So they have the resources um, geographically partitioned and uh, helps them coexist. Um, this is a bird that we kind of, I mentioned that we've been monitoring for several decades all of our seabirds uh, are breeding seabirds and Arctic terns are, are one that we're, um, even though we aggressively manage and protect them, um, they're nesting islands. Um, the last few years, um, we're seeing a little bit of a downturn um, in, the, uh, in the numbers, uh, some just weak, weakness and an otherwise very positive trend but now we seem to be getting into this trend. We're gonna be very interested to see what we see this coming year. So this is the number of um, uh, breeding pairs. So, um, you know, it's ranging, you know, from 2,500, you know, that's a, this, this swing right here is about a 500 bird swing. So it's a concern. You know, it's one out of every six somehow just are, are not breeding. So we keep a very close eye on this. This is our Gulf of Maine seabird working group. This is this uh, collection of field scientists that we get together and share all of our data from the different islands. And we get these kinds of trends and it makes us better managers. Um, some of the things that's interesting going on with the uh, sea level and the water temperature changing, these are some of the, uh, the fish that are important seabird food. And uh, from, from landing stocks, we're, we're learning about that some species are moving rather dramatically uh, northward. Uh, in fact, most are kind of following the colder water towards the north and moving north. Um, we have a few 
that are going the other way that are leaving the Gulf of Maine or heading south. But um, anyway, this is kind of interesting data we get from um, National Marine Fisheries Service. In years when the fish uh, is not available in the way it, that's good for the birds, they start eating these butterfish, which are fine for an adult. They can consume this. But when they bring a butterfish into their young, uh, they think they've done a great job as a parent, but the young are too small and they can't eat the butterfish. So we've had some, some poor years when, uh, because we think because of warming water, shifts in species, uh, the, the forage fish is just um, not as high quality as we'd like to see. We monitor this very carefully. We have every summer, we have um, with spotting scopes, watching puffins, recording exactly uh, what prey they're, br they're bringing in uh, to the young. And so we keep, it, we keep an eye on that as well. Uh, we've got some vagrant marine species that are showing up in the Gulf of Maine that are all from further south and warmer waters. Uh, uh, this is a type of uh, cuttlefish or squid uh, that's uh, southern. Uh, that's a blue crab from the Chesapeake, famous for the Chesapeake Bay region. And uh, this is a black sea bass, which has never been seen in the Gulf of Maine until recently. It is um, uh, just moving into the Gulf of Maine now in big numbers. Um, and then we had a crazy visitation of a tufted puffin a few years ago. We think it came through the Northwest Passage when it was free of ice. We're not sure how this tufted puffin got here. It's kind of like before, before the call began in earnest, we were talking about this stellar sea eagle that is here in Maine now. Um, you know, a very, very lost bird. In addition to the uh, tufted puffin, uh, we've had an, uh, an ancient merlet, which is a Pacific alcid, that's also been seen here in the Gulf of Maine. So uh, when you have a lot of well-trained eyeballs out there, it's, ama it's amazing what you see. Um, we also have an invasive crab species that first showed up in Portland, Maine in 1905, the green crab. And then, you know, very pretty, rapidly in about 50 years, it's inundated the whole coast of Maine and um, they eat clams, which is an important uh, fishery here in Maine. Um, so we're not happy about the green crab and they have really established themselves. And um, there's other examples of, of our uh, invasive species and we monitor them as well. But let's go through a summary and then we'll wrap up the talk and I'll be happy to answer a few questions. Oceans are vast and they're very hard to manage something as big as an ocean basin. And the seabirds are rare and unfortunately they're getting rarer. Uh, conflict with human are, very, are many, including invasive species, uh, coastal development, the loss of habitat, conflict with fisheries, hunting, plastic, and other toxins. Um, for success, we need to really control invasive species, protect and restore habitat, uh, attract and rebuild populations, and control and limit the amount of toxins that get into the environment. Um, here and locally, the seabirds are abundant and they're long live. They serve as apex predators and they're pretty easy to monitor. And, um, and we do uh, the best we can to, to track them. Um, and so we can see what any sort of impact future climates may have uh, on the whole health of the Gulf of Maine. Um, while it's essential to monitor uh, these ecologically and economically important species, it's particularly critical to the, the rarest of them, those range limited species must be monitored. So things like Arctic terns, which have a very limited range, and really about half of our seabirds are 
you know, only found on a, on a few, few islands. So those are very important to monitor. Um, our Gulf of Maine is very unique uh, environment um, where warm water meets cold water. And that mixing is uh, results in a tremendous amount of abundance and um, uh, of food uh, for uh, these range limited species. And then finally, I mean, uh, most birders know about wisdom, this fantastic 70 year old female albatross from Midway Island, um, who is, you know, figuring out, has figured out somehow, you know, all the long lines and all the plastic that floats on the ocean. Somehow this uh, wonderful bird has, uh, been able to get to at least 70 years of age. The reason I say at least, it, it's not known how uh, old uh, Wisdom was when she was banded. Um, so she's at a minimum 70 years old. and Hopefully she's got a few more years left in her. And thank you very much. It's been a pleasure uh, talking about seabirds with you folks. And with that, I'll end the talk and open it up for questions. Thanks so much, Richard. That was fantastic. Learned a lot. Um, so folks, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat at the bottom of the screen, or um, the Q&A is also an option. If you are on Facebook, you can put them in comments, and we'll be monitoring those as well. Um, and uh, I don't see any yet. You can also raise your hand and we can unmute you if you want to ask the question live. I don't see any either, Jenny. I'm monitoring as well. Yeah, somebody asked about the links. Um, uh, yes. Uh... We'll definitely follow up uh, and share the links about the um, field trip guide workshop and the uh, shorebird surveys. Yes. Any questions for Richard? Do you have any questions, Parker? Uh, Looks like we do have one question. What are the birds with no known nesting places? Um, yeah, those are mostly Southern hemisphere uh, petrels and, and uh, several species of storm petrel and some shearwaters that are of only known from photographic uh, documentation. Um, uh, there was an, actually, we had for many years, there was an albatross species that was um, uh, seen at sea, but no known nest sites until, uh, well, in the late 1980s, I believe, the new Amsterdam albatross was finally found a single colony on a, you know, deep, Oceanic Island in this uh, in this South Atlantic, New Amsterdam Island, um, but um, I can look that up and get the actual names of the ones that are still. Uh, there was a, th a bird called the magenta petrel. Don't know that that nest site's ever been found. Um, it's been seen at uh, sea, um, and um, but it's yeah yeah. So there, there are a few out there. No known nest sites, not yet anyway. Nature always has a way of surprising us, doesn't it? <laughs> Even when we think we know everything. Really. Uh, it looks like Francine has a question. Um, Francine, you can unmute yourself and ask your question if you'd like. Looks like you're still 
muted. Um, but we yeah, have. I see. I, I see her question. Uh, well, we we had a got a lot of experience uh, building uh, sound uh, outdoor sound systems running off the solar panels. Um, we used um, we used them for uh, turn attraction and cre recreation for the albatross in Hawaii. Uh, that was a big part of the work that Dave and I did in the Galapagos was um, playing broadcast uh, courtship calls uh, to the um, to seabirds. Um, uh, basically, we we made. Um, continuous loop, we found us a good representative sample of some, um, you know, very, very uh, good, well-recorded vocalizations. And then we just made a continuous loop tape out of them and um, played them um, and, um, and, and ran them in the field for, you know, literally in some cases, weeks, weeks on end, we would, play them um, on, on the islands, so. And same with the decoys. We've done a lot of work over the years with uh, turn decoys, puffin decoys, albatross decoys. Um, very effective at, uh, you know, luring birds to new habitat or to former habitat. So it's social attraction. We did a lot of that. I have a question, Richard. Mm -hmm. uh, were there any other species besides the Atlantic puffin that you and your colleagues have noticed an upward trend in uh, the main populations? Well, I showed that slide of the Arctic turn, and I know I focused a little bit on the weakening in the last three or four years, but that bird um, really has made a, a, a dramatic recovery. Uh, uh, it was down in the hundreds, and now we're in the you know, 2,500 to 3,000. Um, so we, most of our monitored seabirds are in the Gulf of Maine are actually trending upwards. Um, so uh, we're doing pretty well uh, compared to seabirds globally. They're globally seabirds are in decline. Gulf of Maine, we're doing pretty good. We have, a, we still have some concerns, but we're, we have more razor bills now. We are turns, um, there's more terns, more puffins, uh, but we have wardens on all of the principal islands. I showed you the slide early in the deck. Uh, every one of those red dotted islands, the, the significant seabird islands, there is a crew that is out there all summer um, and they act as wardens. So if we get a night heron, which can run wild in a seabird island, um, you know, where there's somebody there to take it, make sure they get it off the island. And uh, you know, there's not much you can do about peregrines. A peregrine that finds your turn colony can cause the colony to uh, abandon. You know, you, you get 3000 birds, they're just like, we're out of here. So we just, uh, there's a lot of management, but we have, um, stewards on all of the islands and humans make a, a real difference it's a really interesting story we would not have a stable and growing population of seabirds here in maine if it wasn't for the hands-on presence of humans so it's a kind of a good story you know it's like people helping the birds as soon as the people leave the island, oh, the gulls move in and just run, run wild. So, yeah, a pretty aggressive, aggressively managed and to a good end. Thank you for the question, Parker. 
Of course, and uh, um, I have a quote. Uh, one of our participants says, thank you, Richard, for the great presentation that affirms the importance of management and restoration. There you go. So true. So I, I invite you all to uh, come, come to Maine. I lead uh, boat trips three times a week. Uh, we don't often get to the far offshore islands, but um, uh, we see all the guillemots and cormorants and terns, and we have a, a really good time. And uh, if you ever make it to Maine, get in touch with me and I will steer you to a uh, uh, to some good bird watching. And maybe the stellar sea eagles take up residence here in Maine and be here for us to watch for uh, many years to come. It's like the lottery. Who's going to win this bird? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, that was a great presentation. And um, I think everyone really enjoyed it. And we appreciate you staying up late out there in Maine for us. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up and we'll see everyone next month, hopefully. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.